Uh, we appreciate that. Uh, the, tonight's proceedings are being recorded and they will be posted on the Commission's website. So just like any other legislative committee hearing, uh, it's accessible to the public. We are holding a formal public hearing and as chairwoman of the Commission, I'm bound to follow the legislative rules on how to conduct the hearing. So if you choose to testify, we do need to ask you to identify your name, where you live, uh, who you represent if you're not just representing yourself individually. And then I also need to ask you to go through the chair, which is myself, so that you can be identified for the internet purposes. Um, we will do everything we can to be fair in terms of time. Again, we were allotted approximately two hours for the presentation and testimony. If it turns out that you need more, if there's more time needed, we are prepared to stay here um, for as long as it takes, although we would ask that you perhaps don't repeat things. I definitely need to ask you that as highly emotional and controversial as this is, that we be respectful. And both of the, uh, the members of the commission and us to you as well, but for everybody who's been involved in this in all aspects. We won't be asking people who were part of the uh, firefighting efforts or state agencies, they, are, they won't be here tonight to be asked questions up front but certainly we represent the General Assembly and we are here to hear your concerns. And um, there are also, in the back of the room, we've prepared a form that if you are not comfortable with testifying, public speaking isn't your thing, um, then we've got a feedback form that you can provide that information to us because again, we really do want to hear from you. You can email us, each of the commission members, you can give us a phone call, whatever uh, best suits you in terms of communicating with us. We do know that this is going to be likely a difficult night for everybody who's here. Uh, we want you to be as comfortable as possible. We do have water uh, to provide to you. Um, and if you're speaking and you feel like you need a break and you want to keep regain your composure, just let us know that because we're happy to, to take a pause. We are at the Capitol, unfortunately, a number of times we're dealing with folks who've been through very difficult times. So uh, this, this will be something to some degree that we're experienced in, although again, we will never understand exactly what you've been through. With that, I would like to um, point out the fact that there are lawsuits in the works, and um, it is important that, that again, you understand that when you testify tonight, it is public public record so there's nothing that we can do in terms of comments that you might make here today that is out in the public domain that's not meant to in any way discourage you from talking it's just we want to be very clear that this is um, a public hearing I will uh, at this point turn to our Deputy Attorney General David Blake who is going to talk to you about the claims process which again is the different procedure that if you had damages, um, that what you would need to go through to alert them that you have a claim. So, uh, Mr. Clay. I want to express on behalf of the Attorney General uh, our sympathies for your loss. Uh, 
Uh, however, my purpose of being here tonight is simply to inform you about the process uh, going forward in making claims. Uh, I'm not, I cannot actually address any substance uh, allegations or anything along those lines. Uh, and for the record, I'm not uh, advising the Attorney General or the Board or anybody else in uh, the Executive Branch on how to deal with litigation that allows me to be here to address uh, you all as well as the Commission. I have two main points because there's been a number of miscommunications or misrepresentations. Uh, most recently, there was a mistake in a Denver Post story uh, regarding the Commission that it would be allocating um, to make findings related to compensation. Uh, that is not accurate. So I hope you all take what I have to say uh, to heart, and if there are questions, I will stick around and address those questions uh, at the end of the night. There are two main points. The first one is that you must file a notice of claim. Uh, the notice of claim form was I provided a number of copies to the commission earlier. It's also on the web page uh, for Department of Public Safety. Uh, it's also where I can make it available. Uh, again, you can get in contact through me, to me, through the commission. Uh, I can email it to you. The reason that you must file a notice of claim is one, you cannot uh, rely on your insurance company or anybody else to file your claim. And if you do not file your notice of claim, uh, your rights will be extinguished upon the 180 day clock. That clock runs somewhere between September 22nd and September 25th. So I'm asking you and imploring you, please, 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 if you're going to make a claim related to this matter, you must file a one page form notifying the Attorney General that your intent to make a claim no later than September 22nd. But I encourage you to do it today, do it tonight, do it tomorrow. It's very simple. And then you will be part of the process as it moves forward and your rights will be protected. The second issue that I want to make sure everybody understands is the process is not going to be quick, unfortunately. Uh, there is litigation that's pending right now. Uh, it's, uh, initiated by a number of insurance companies that also have fire claims it's in Jefferson County. And all of your claims will be heard in that courtroom from that judge. That ensures that the claims will be treated uh, equally, fairly, and efficiently. Um, so if you are now, if you make a claim, going to be part of that lawsuit. Um, and I can talk a little bit more, more about that later, or if the commission wants me to address it, it certainly can. Um, but because it's now going to be litigated, uh, that process has to come to finality before there will be any uh, type of compensation allocated. So it's possible that that can get expedited if there's some sort of settlement or some other arrangement made by the parties in that litigation. Um, but the bottom line is I want everybody to understand that as you make decisions about how you move forward, uh, that there will not be, for example, any compensation if it's allocated. Uh, that will be forthcoming any time in the near future. Um, to touch just briefly on the lawsuit, and it was brought by a number of insurance companies originally. Uh, we have responded to that and interpled uh, that has brought other claimants into that lawsuit, at least those persons who have already filed claims. That's some of them. The last time I checked, we had approximately 50 claims total, and most of those were insurance companies. So I know that many of the people in this room have not filed claims. Again, you must file a claim or your rights will not be protected as the litigation results. The other reason that that's extraordinarily important is the process set up by House Bill 1361, which creates the additional process to go in front of the claims board, uh, triggers only off of that lawsuit. So if you don't have a claim in front of a judge, the judge the county, you won't be able to pursue uh, presentation to the board and the, uh, the new authorities under uh, 1361. I think that's probably all I want to address at this point. I think I'll wait and listen to everybody's uh, presentations and then some backup to try and answer any questions and make them up at that point. But again, I want to reiterate the point that you must file a notice of claim by September 22nd or you essentially waive your rights. Madam Chair. Thank you. We have a question from Representative uh, Mr. Blake, thank you very much. I appreciate you being here. Um, based on, I was approached by my constituents regarding House Bill 1361, and I think 
it may just need a little bit of further um, explanation. There's some confusion between the interaction between uh, House Bill 1361 and the lawsuits that you mentioned. What they asked me to read is, given the legislation that was passed on in House Bill 1361, why isn't the Claims Board reviewing the individual claims of the victims and making their recommendation for compensation to the victims as was the intent of the legislation? Further, it was the intent of the bill that if the victims did not accept the board's recommendation, they would then pursue their own litigation. Their question is, why are you circumventing the intent of the lit litigation and doing it backwards? Uh, Madam Chair? And yes, Mr. Lake. Uh, thank you, Representative, for the question. Um, I don't want to speak to the intent of the legislation. Um, the, the, the law, though, is clear. What the legislation did was modify Colorado Governmental Immunity Act in a way that we backed up. Prior to the legislation, um, the Governmental Immunity Act did not recognize fires. The government started alleged negligent fires. So there was no opportunity for any claim to be brought against the state because the state was immune. What 1361 did was retroactively waive the immunity that the state could have asserted. That created the opportunity for people in this room, as well as others affected by the fire, to bring a claim against the state. It, in addition to that, created an opportunity for the claims board to review claims at some point after the $600,000 cap was exhausted, and only if the maximum amount for any incident, $600,000 in this case, was completely allocated. The process that you're speaking about would, in fact, be the process we would follow, except for the fact that we have litigation over uh, negligence. That is, we have multiple claimants, all paying different amounts of money, and so that litigation now has to run its course to finality before the $600,000 is allocated. And the board can't hear any claims until the court decides uh, not only negligence, but how it's going to allocate the $600,000. So the board can't consider monies above and beyond the six hundred thousand dollars until the court rules. Did I answer your question? Representative Juror. Uh, thank you, Senator Roberts. Um, you know, I think David, I, I think we're getting there. I think what, what they're concerned about, and, and I think that the statement was rather definite about their concerns. Um, when you said this morning that it was going to take a long time to settle this lawsuit, what they're concerned about was the intent of the House Bill 1361 was to try to find a shorter path for some type of conclusion and some type of, of, of um, resolution for them. And what they're concerned about is that short time path of 1361 because of these lawsuits has now um, been lost, and that this, basically, if I'm interpreting what they're thinking, is they're thinking that 1361 now doesn't matter so much, and, and, and we both know that as far as caps, it very much does, but they were looking for a shorter resolution that was part of the intent of the legislation. So, um, and, and their concern was this morning when they said it's gonna be a long time before that's resolved. Uh, can you explain a little bit what you're thinking in that? Madam Chair? Mr. Blake. Uh, thank you, Representative Drew. Um, I, I don't want to speak to whether or not it was the legislative intent to make a shorter path. What I certainly would agree to is that the legislative intent was to create a path at all. In other words, prior to 1361, there was no path whatsoever to bring a claim against the state if negligence was shown because the state was immune for this type of maintenance if it were approved. So shorter or not, there was no opportunity to bring a claim prior to 1961. Um, and so I think that was largely the intent. Now a shorter path, uh, we didn't change, there was no change to 1361 as far as the process is concerned. And so anytime uh, there's a claim brought against the state for alleged negligence, um, this is the process that was always going to be followed. Of course, none of the process under the Government of the Unity Act was ever touched by the Act. Mm -hmm. So the, uh, the new authority given to the Board to consider claims above and beyond to make recommendations to the General Assembly 
that was a new authority, but it always triggered after uh, the original governmental immunity cap was exhausted. Representative Jerome. Thank you, Senator Roberts. Um, I think, David, what they're thinking about is through the course of 1361, when it was being presented in the legislature, the conversations um, reflected back to a time um, when then Governor Romer was involved in a particular case where he used executive order and um, there was a lift of caps and individuals were compensated for an accident uh, having to do with the Department of Transportation. So that, I believe that that's what they're thinking about. And, and I understand that you, your understanding of the law, it's, it's much more difficult for individuals that are not only victims in this instance, but also not lawyers to interpret the, the layering of, of law. And, um, and and quite honestly, I'll just say it now, 1361, my intent was to shorten the process. Madam Chair. Thank you, Mr. Lake. Uh, thank you, Madam Chair. Um, Representative Jerome, the, the comparison to um, uh, the birthday pass event, it's, it's not accurate to say that the tax were waived in that instance. Um, the caps were in place always, and what was actually set up there was a, was a separate lawsuit uh, brought under uh, 1983. So it was a combined version of those two that was actually settled uh, by the state in that instance. Um, so again, I'm not, I don't know, I wasn't obviously here at uh, the state uh, when that was settled or that case proceeded, so I don't know if this was shorter or longer. And my problem is simply, I don't know how long it's going to take. But I want to make sure everybody in the room is aware that to the extent compensation is awarded, it's not going to, I don't believe, be quick. And that's because the litigation, which, which um, preserves everybody's rights, the insurance companies, the people here, anyone else who brings a claim, all of those rights have to be treated fairly and equitably. And so that's why in the litigation, I'm expecting as many claimants as there are going to be and the diversity of those claims that the will actually can't bear with the time. Thank you. Um, now I'd like to actually ask the commission members if they'd like to introduce themselves and make some comments if we start with you. Thank you, Matthew. Thank you. Yes. <coughs> I'm Jeannie Nicholson. I'm a state senator along with uh, Senator Roberts. And in January of 2013, I will represent this area um, because it will be included in my new district because of reapportionment. And I think it's one of the reasons that I was um, asked to serve on the committee, but also because included in my current district um, was the Four Mile Canyon fire event and gave me some background from that experience with the residents in that community of some of the issues that this community is dealing with now. My, uh, I was also the uh, Senate sponsor along with Senator Cadman on 1361 and it was my intent to create a process for those claims that didn't exist before. And I'm very happy to be here tonight because I think, uh, along I think with the rest of the commissioners, that the most important work that we have to do is to learn any lessons from the experience of your community so that we can do our very best um, to prevent this from happening anywhere else in the state in the future. Good evening, my name is Claire Levy, and uh, I represent House District 13, which uh, includes Western Boulder County, which experienced um, a devastating wildfire over Labor Day in 2010, it's the Four Mile Canyon fire, um, and I think that's one of the reasons why I was asked to be on this commission. Uh, I, it's my intent actually to keep my comments and my remarks and questions to a minimum tonight. This is your night uh, to talk to us. 
Um, we have, as the chair mentioned, toured uh, a bit of the burn area. We've by no means seen everything, but um, for me, I want to tell you that, you know, as with many situations like this, seeing it has told me I've learned so much more than I could learn sitting in a room at the Capitol uh, looking at slides and hearing testimonies. So, so uh, we apologize for starting somewhat late, but I think it was well worth our while to actually see the area. Um, I also want to echo the condolences extended by the chair. Um, I have not experienced what you have gone through. I was evacu pretty evacuated uh, in the, uh, the Flagstaff fire, but came nowhere close to suffering anything similar to what you have. And so you have my condolences. Uh, and, and I know that we can't do anything here to bring back what you lost. The last thing I want to say is that I, I know you have many questions. Uh, we will listen tonight. We cannot answer those questions tonight. Uh, but the purpose of this hearing is so that we hear your questions, hear your experiences, and then hopefully in the meetings that we have remaining, we can try to get those answers so you have some satisfaction and some closure. Good evening, my name is Sherry Terrell. I'm your representative. I, I think we've all spent a lot of time either here or over at the middle school since the fire occurred. Um, I thank you very much for giving your evening to this cause. Uh, I was the sponsor of House Bill 1352, which is what this is all about. And then also uh, House Bill 1361 that we were talking to David Blake with the Attorney General's Office as far as the compensation side of this. Um, I, I appreciate the fact that um, we all live up here, we, we mitigate, we take care of the properties that we own. We also understand the risks in our communities and the intent of the individuals that were involved in all of this is to make sure that it's, it's better for those who follow after everything that we've experienced and what we learn from from this assembly, and I just want to thank you all very much. If you decide that you don't want to testify, as, the, as Senator Roberts said, we're always more than willing to um, take your information later. I know there was a gentleman that forwarded some questions to me, which I'll be asking of the agencies further into the process when they're before us. But um, if you think of something tomorrow night, if you think think of something tonight before you go to bed. Just write it down, send it to us, and we're more than happy to get the information for you. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, good evening. My name is Jim Davis. I am the Executive Director of the Colorado Department of Public Safety. Uh, House Bill 1283, which was passed by the legislature and signed by the governor at the end of uh, this past legislative session, transferred wildfire uh, the state's responsibility for wildfire mitigation response to the Department of Public Safety. So that's now within our department. Uh, we are uh, we are working on that transition, and we are here to uh, to learn what we can uh, to uh, to make sure that that, that we provide uh, good service to the residents of Colorado. One one question. One thing I failed to add is we do have a website where, again, everything that we're hearing as commission members, PowerPoints are posted on there. It's a way to reach the staff. We don't have individual staff, but we do have staff at the Capitol. And uh, Bo, do you want to mention what that way, way to contact our email? They're going to look it up and mention it later. Uh, but it, again, we want to make sure that you know we are here to hear you tonight, but also through email and any other means possible. Um, I do want to say that our staff who have helped us prepare for this and uh, have given us a very helpful notebook, not only on Lower North Fork, but Colorado's forest health, wildfire issues, um, because again, we are citizen legislators and we're not experts in this either, so it, it's been a um, learning curve for all of us, and I think it's important for the state of Colorado 
uh, for this community, but also the entire state. So with that, I would ask if we, I've got the sign-up sheet um, here, and I don't, I'm not quite sure who's organizing the presentation to us. Okay, great. And you are Tom Scanlon? Yeah. Thank you. Um, actually, we set the room up so that there were chairs reserved for you all, so you can see the presentation. I know we have to provide you the copy afterwards, and we will do that. So if you if you'd like to go there, or if you want to turn around, whichever is more comfortable for you. Uh, is Jean or Tyler here? Can you dim the lights for us? Thank you. There have been fundraisers to help us out. There have been uh, 
authors that help uh, to come up to the mountain and, and understand what uh, what we're going through in the trauma that we have. But I but I think most of all I I want to make sure that what we're about to talk about here addresses not uh, the outstanding heroes that we have in the fire departments that responded, nor the police departments that responded. They are our heroes. They, they've always been there to help us whenever there's been a natural disaster and, uh, and even in this horrific mistake. So, so nothing we're going to say is, is meant to denigrate their outstanding service to this community. Uh, and I think I have a button if it works. So, the first thing you asked was how can we prevent this tragedy from occurring to our neighbors? And that's what we have tried really hard to address in this entire presentation. Not to point fingers at, at anyone or anything, but specifically to address the kinds of things that are necessary to ensure this nap never happens again. Um, I would like to point out, uh, this is our home, or was our home, uh, and I heard people talking about the lack of mitigation uh, and the kinds of things that were necessary that hadn't been done. As you can see, we prepared an entire meadow in front of our house so that we wouldn't have fire uh, potential fire problems with the house. And you can also see that the house was constructed out of concrete. It also used the highest uh, rating fire protective shingles and decking to prevent this kind of disaster. And you can see what happened anyway. And as you were up at, the, at our property, uh, I know you went by uh, one of the houses next to the schoolhouse. And as you saw, there was only four or five trees on that entire 10 acres. There's nothing that was able to be done to mitigate for that type of disaster. And we're going to talk, therefore, about what needed to be done to prevent this disaster in the first place. And in my line of business, by the way, I build rockets and satellites, and I, uh, and I launch rockets. Um, uh, we find that when there is a disaster, it's never one thing. It is a compilation of things all working together. Together that, uh, that were either ignored or overlooked or not compensated for. And, uh, and in this case, uh, these are the three areas that uh, we'd like to talk about tonight to try and help you understand the interrelationships of the problems that occur. Um, as I said, usually there's more than one thing. And uh, the Bass Review Team, excuse me, Bill Bass was the review team leader of the prescribed fire review. Um, although the, the documentation for that reflected that there were a number of problems that were encountered. In fact, many of the things we'll talk to you about tonight were extracted from that report. Um, the only public uh, or the public feeling after that report was made, was presented, was that there was really only one error, and that was the decision not to monitor on the third day. Uh, that is a completely erroneous perception to have, and we're hoping to be able to show you what the other things that were, uh, that happened, that could have prevented this fire, and hopefully will prevent any others in the future. Um, also, before we start, I guess I'd like to uh, reflect on what it takes if we, as private citizens, uh, are going to uh, are going to have a prescribed fire. And, uh, and what I'd like you to do is keep these rigid requirements in the back of your mind as we talk about the critical things that need to be done during a prescribed burn and after. Um, Roy Johnson is responsible for reviewing those types of plans. So, Roy, if you want to take this, I'd be happy to give it to you. <laughs> um, not only am I a firefighter, but I also have a forest agricultural plan. Part of my forest agricultural plan dictates that I burn, or it doesn't dictate that I burn, but I often burn. I work with the Canyon Fire Department to burn. Slices created from the 
with the fourth work that I do. These are the requirements that we have. Before we can, we have to get a burn permit from the local fire department. We have to call the local fire department the day before, and we call them the day of, and then we call them when we're done. Um, and I reviewed my plan this morning uh, with Tom. The only, it's actually two inches of snow. I, this, when I did my burn this February, I actually had three feet of snow, and that's what we prefer. Uh, as much snow on the ground as possible. Um, if, if you, we'd have a chance to get looked at what I do my burns. I have a big landing. Um, there's a, a burn of dirt um, for the, it's getting cold and flat. Um, one of the other things is that we want the, the local fire departments require that we have that fire out before we depart. There's a $10,000 fine. If I walk away from my fire and leave any smoke coming up off that fire, it's a $10,000 fine to any person. We have to make sure that that fire is absolutely cold dead out. Um, the way I do this when I do my burning is I take and I bury the, the ashes and snow, I plow it flat, I rebury it and I plow it again and then I do what we call in the wild part business, cold trail. I walk through and I touch everything that's black to make sure that there's no heat coming off. That's the way you make sure that a fire's cold head out. The prescribed burn, now admittedly they're trying to burn up stuff, but they did not make sure that this fire was cold dead out. They left that thing smoking for days. Not only did they leave it smoking, they thought in their minds that it was okay to just drive away for approximately two days, 44 hours, four hours short of two complete days, with nobody looking at it. Um, there was a period of time in there where citizens, concerned citizens, made 911 calls for smoke in the area, on the Saturday after the enforcers, people had left. Um, Ward Ford Fire Department had started a response. They were told, oh, the war service had already been there. It's just residual smoke from their control burn. All that stuff leads to, by conclusion, the uh, extreme complacency on the part of the Colorado State War Service. Uh, I think that's all we need. I think we beat this subject to death. I'll return the Mike to Tom, and I think he's on. Actually, oops. Roy just gave the rest of my presentation. <laughs> <laughs> so this should go a lot faster. Um, this is a, this is a uh, Google map uh, depiction of the topography. You already saw it today. Um, you were down here in the burn area. And, uh, and, and the thing that we wanted to point out with this map is the, the Colorado State Forest Service definition of a high-risk rate, uh, high-risk rating, is that there are limited containment opportunities and additional resources and people would be required. Let me point out, you, I, I'm assuming you came down the road along the ridge line to be able to see where the prescribed burn the, uh, the limited containment plan that was published was there is a small dirt road that runs at the bottom of this canyon. And that small dirt road was supposed to be the, uh, if there had been a problem, it was supposed to be the area that they were supposed to stop the fire. Um, however, if it escapes from that, beyond that boundary, there's a road down here, Foxton Road coming down here. There is a small road that goes through a private development that stops up at the top of this hill. And from there on, there is nothing but wild land, gullies, increasingly steep terrain, and Kester Road lying exposed to anything that happened if that fire escaped. Recognizing the moderate rate given by the Forest Service, we think that probably led to the uh, complacent attitude that Roy was just talking about, where 
on day two, there was only one person in the fire for four hours, from about 10 to 30 until about 2 o'clock in the afternoon. The person who left the area with smoke still coming from the burn site uh, and made the decision to leave the area unmanned. By the way, Roy pointed out 44 hours. Well, for four hours there was one person there. The previous day, they wrapped up at about 6 o'clock at night. So it was really more than two days that, uh, that the, 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 the burn site was on the end. And finally, on the day the fire, wildfire broke out, there were only three people there. Specifically, it said to check the fire, uh, complete mop-up operations, and pick up equipment. In my line of business, uh, if, if uh, we have a critical risk like that, it's it's absolutely essential that we go through some kind of critical risk assessment. And in fact, what we normally do is we go through a peer review where we bring together all the people that uh, have done this type of thing before. And we talk about the risks and what could happen. And we identify all of the requirements necessary to mitigate those risks. And then finally, we have a, a separate independent team review what the peer <coughs> review group did to make sure that they didn't forget anything or get into what we call group think. There's no indication in any of the documentation that we looked through that uh, reflected that, that that type of review was done. I talked about Kester Road. Unfortunately, you can't see it very well, but these are the homes that burned. So there were a lot more homes there. And oh, by the way, beyond that was an entire uh, community of homes and more homes to the north. However, despite that, and despite the single containment line, the, uh, the Forest Service rated this plan as a moderate damage to vegetation habitat and no residents were expected to be involved. I'll buy that no residents would have been involved in this area. The problem was there was a requirement to identify trigger points uh, and other than this road, there was no trigger points identified in the entire burn plan. I would suggest that perhaps there is a culture of risk acceptance uh, within the Forest Service. In fact, I'm sorry, I guess I need to go a little bit further. So, as I said, in my line of business, uh, launching rockets, if I had a moderate potential that a rocket would explode on launch day and damage the homes that are near our locations, I would not be allowed to make a decision to go launch that rocket. I will tell you that the burn plan that was identified and the checklists that were identified showed one high risk, I forget the exact number, but it was on the order of 45 or 47 moderate risks, and two or three low risks. Is there a culture of risk acceptance in this organization? If Jack uh, ah, as a pilot, was uh, was uh, was in charge of your plane coming up, Senator Roberts. And he got on the uh, and he got on the uh, speaker and he said, uh, "You know, we've gone through a review, we've looked the plane over. Unfortunately, there is a moderate chance that we're going to crash on land." And, uh, and oh, by the way, it's Sunday, and so the rest of the crew that would normally help you get out there and crash, we let them go today. Not so clear to me that you would have been here tonight. Or alternatively, my wife, who is, is an emergency room nurse, uh, if a patient came into the emergency room on Sunday, and, uh, and was put into a position, well, let, let, me, let me even be more, more direct. Suppose a 
you, any one of us, had to decide whether or not to have elective surgery. Prescribed fire is elective surgery in my mind. Um, and, uh, and the doctor says to you, well, it really isn't necessary to do it. But if you decide to do it, um, we have a moderate risk that you may die on the table. I know I would be real excited about that, that kind of discussion. And, and oh, by the way, uh, if we have a problem during the surgery, uh, the nearest help that we have, because it's Sunday and we've let all of our other employees off, the nearest help we have is a half hour away. But if they get the blood here, and if it's not a big problem, we'll be able to help you out. I'm sorry, uh, I, I realize I'm not supposed to be emotional, but, but I, I wanted to put it into perspective what we were facing and what we got here. We went out through the public forum to try and find what the specific requirements were for this prescribed fire. And, uh, and I apologize, this is the second uh, error uh, type. Uh, it was in 2006 that the first plan was put together that we found. There was a modification made prior to a prescribed burn that occurred in October of 2011. And then the, the plan for this prescribed burn. And, uh, and after going through those burns, which we got through open source, I mean those burn plans, which we got through open sources, we found that there, well, we couldn't find any significant difference in any of the three burn plans, despite the fact that in October of 2011, there was a prescribed burn that was being planned. They had gone up and done uh, what I they probably explained to you as a black line for that prescribed burn. And, uh, and depending on what document you look at, one or two days later, after just doing the black lining, not the prescribed burn, a, uh, another fire ignited, a spot fire, and the local fire department had to be called in to put that fire out. Well, it turns out that, that where that uh, uh, black line escape occurred was exactly the same area that the, uh, that the uh, escape occurred in our fire. And, and more importantly, as I said in my line of business, it would have been mandatory that after this problem occurred, I would have updated my plan to identify contingencies to be able to figure out what we're going to do if uh, another escape occurred. And I'm going to read you some stuff here in a couple of minutes that talk about what contingencies were in that burn plan. I'm going to read it out of the burn plan so you understand. Uh, but most important to us is not only the problem resulting from that, but when we start talking about weather, I'd also like you to remember how critical it would be to have incorporated the predicted weather that was about to occur. So, a high-risk definition taken from, from the Forest Service's plan was if there's high fuel loading or concentrations present, it should be a high-risk rating. It turns out that uh, when Chief Rogers arrived on the scene of the, of the wildfire day, in his, in his report, it specifically, he specifically identified his concern about the high loadings that had occurred from the masticated fuel. The other thing that I want to make sure you recognize when you were up there, that you saw it, uh, and if you didn't, we'll get you pictures, was that the mastication occurred not only in the prescribed burn area, but was also in the area that I showed you on the opposite side of the hill, going down to what we are calling the trigger. And Roy, if, uh, 
there's something I'm supposed to take out of this? I just wanted that. That's the, the prescribed complexity. This is what they base those, those high, the high risk rating definition comes out of this. Prescribed fire complexity rating system guide. This is the high definition. In their work plan, they rated it to moderate. So in their, in their work plan, they rated it moderate. Um, this is the definition of high. So um, Mr. Scanlon has already reiterated what it would be, what you should take away from a moderate rating. But there's probably a reason just for a moderate rating to cancel this prescribed burn. When we go through their definitions, this is the document they use to come up with those ratings. When we look at that, a bunch of these moderates should have been rated high. And when you rate those things high, then there's absolutely no reason to do this work in that in the weather conditions that prevailed at that time. Uh, with respect to the second order, uh, you have been up there, you've seen what it looked like, and I showed you the map that showed what the terrain uh, looked like. Steep slopes, abrupt changes, several directional aspects that lead to unpredictable local winds. Now let me make sure that, that I'm clear on what I'm saying about unpredictable. That doesn't say that the weather wasn't predicted coming in. It means that the terrain, as Rocco Snark said this morning, that the terrain creates an environment that allows swirling of, of the wind and different directions in all areas on the mountain. And therefore, it should have been a high risk rating. As I'll show you, we had weather predictions. And finally, uh, that those weather, those, all of these aspects might result in variations of, of uh, fire behavior that could present major challenges. Not only did the fire prove that there were uh, major control challenges, but there were no, there was no prepositioning of equipment, there was no uh, placing of additional resources, there were no extra people put around despite the winds, the smoke, and the lack of adequate planning. So our question is, is this really, as some people have suggested, freak weather conditions? I will suggest to you that those weather conditions as Sherry Jarrell would know, and the Senator, I know you know. Those are the weather conditions that occur in the mountains all the time, particularly when a front is going through. Or was it grossly poor planning? So now we've got a problem. <laughs> this, I wanted to read a couple of things, and I think I can do it, even in this dim light. Uh, the first thing I wanted to read was uh, was a uh, was reported by Chief McLaughlin, who who you already have already met, and uh, he said as he was attempting to mobilize the initial response on the ground, he only had out access to outdated topography maps. So when we look at those maps, we don't know where homes are, and we don't know where roads are, and in a lot of cases that have gone on since the last time these maps were updated which was in 1994. Um, he further went on to say, uh, when he was asked about the burn plan, he said, I haven't looked at the burn plan at all because that wasn't provided to us prior to them going in and starting the burn. These are the firemen whose lives are on the line to go and try and protect so now what I'd like to do is read to you from the burn plan. The first thing, the first thing I'd like to point out is during, uh, during the burn, there's supposed to be a minimum of 1,500 gallons of water available. Now I'm sure it was because there were a lot of trucks up there during the burn. However, it also says during the extended mop up, there are supposed to be 1,500 gallons of water available on site. Uh, as you'll remember, and I'll show you here in a minute, there was an ATV with a 70 gallon tank on it. And although I don't know this for a fact, I don't think it was full because the reports say the, uh, the driver had to go to 
down to the Red Gate to be able to get water. The second thing it recognizes in the burn plan is steep slopes are a concern. They will cause fatigue for ignition personnel and may generate rolling rocks and debris hazards for holding personnel. Remember back to the picture that I showed you of the terrain in the area and what would what a person on foot would have had to have done to be able to contain that fire to prevent it from getting to Kessler Road. The only other option that me as a novice would see is prepositioning fire equipment on Kester Road so you could come down toward the burn, and that wasn't done. And as Rocco Snark said today, uh, uh, it is impossible when people are fleeing a fire to be able to get the equipment up. So again, I ask the question, what kind of planning was really done? Uh, active mop-up, this is now talking about the extended mop-up and patrol plan. Active mop-up will occur on the second day as necessary. Following that, mop-up efforts will focus on any remaining heavy smoke-producing fuels further interior to the unit. Active mop-up will continue on additional days based on predicted weather, predicted weather, and smoke production. Most prescribed burns don't escape the day of ignition. They usually kick up during a wind event a day or two after the burn or creep into underground uh, and, or across the line in dry organic material. This is in their plan. From that perspective, I guess I again ask the question, where does the contingency there was one line in this whole uh, document that I found that addressed contingency planning. And that basically said, and I'm sorry I can't remember it exactly, but it basically said we will, we will initiate additional strategies to contain the fire. It was a one-liner, and that was the contingency plan. In my line of business, usually say hope is not a strategy and that's all they had in the plans. Now we're talking about technical triggers and it says specifically in an area outside the maximum manageable area uh, if there are ignitions as a result of spotting and or spread from the prescribed fire, the fire will be promptly managed. Oh, in fact, I'm sorry. <laughs> this is the contingency plan. Uh, the, the fire will be promptly managed with appropriate strategies and resources. We go down to the bottom. In the event slop overs uh, and or spot fires are more than what can be adequately managed on-site personnel prior to the next burn period, the prescribed fire will be declared a wildfire. And it wasn't even there for down at the bottom. It was when we had the slop over that it should have been declared. Now, I want to make sure that I, I'm not leading you down the path. This is for the day of the prescribed burn. But there's nothing in there about what happens during the month of so I would, I would like to suggest that the planning was inadequate for contingency planning since it didn't even address those minimum requirements. Finally, I'm talking about the I think I'm the initial escape prescribed fire action. This plan is developed to consider the initial action response from the fire and resource management personnel in the event the fire can no longer be managed as a prescribed burn. The events or conditions which lead the prescribed fire's command staff to make this determination in addition to an obvious escape outside the MMA, the managed area, are called trigger points and must be identified. When you look at uh, Chief Rogers' report of the day he was called to the wildfire and he was talking to the IC, 
assistant commander, incident commander, um, uh, the first thing in his statement said, we need to establish trigger points. There were no trigger points that had been identified, at least to him. And, uh, and the incident commander had agreed that, yeah, we need to do that. And more importantly, they said it was going to be down at the bottom of the road, or, or that road that I showed you in the gully. You heard Robert Snark talk this morning about the problem of being down in a gully and what happens in a fire as it goes whipping down a mountain and creates a convection and creates a, an unmanageable situation. In fact, another report um, of a crew that had gone up to help contain the fire on the south side said when they got there, they could not go in because of the risk to themselves in that south area. Finally, the only place that I found anything in the entire report that addressed weather was a checklist for the prescribed burn, not for the mop-up afterwards. And its checklist item number three has spot weather forecast, has a spot weather forecast been obtained? Have all weather prescriptions and parameters been met? And I couldn't find any prescribed weather requirements in that document. Finally, this morning, as we listened to the uh, gentleman from the Nature Conservancy, uh, he made a statement that said we need to keep prescribed burns as a tool. Uh, I'm sorry. He said we need to keep prescribed burns as a tool in our in our uh, utility kit for taking care of our, our hazardous fire, uh, forest areas. And while we agree with that, we, we think, number one, that it requires a much more rigorous planning activity. And number two, that I was wondering why uh, they feel that this, is, this high risk activity is so important. And, uh, and I found it in their burn plan. And, and I was also informed by the gentleman that one of the reasons that prescribed burns are so useful is that they cost so little. The total cost for a, per acre estimated for this burn was $234 an, uh, an acre. So let me go back again to my business and, uh, and most people who do risk management. And that, and that says that uh, there are a number of risks that we can mitigate and we can reduce it and we do everything that we possibly can to have low risks, not moderate or high risks. But there are some things that you just can't do anything to mitigate. And typically we call those narrow, deep holes. Narrow because there's a low probability that they'll happen like an escape fire because uh, all the documentation says it doesn't happen often. But when it does, there is a huge cost associated with it. And it is nowhere like near $234 an acre. It results in loss of lives, it results in loss of homes, and it results in a loss of So, you all understand, I think, what mastication is. I don't even think I need to go into that any further. But the, the one thing to take away from this is look at the fuels. I think Roy showed you some of the fuels that were up there. The fact that it creates high loading densities, that we were in a, the hottest, driest uh, march on record. Therefore, I think somebody this morning was talking about uh, two by fours and uh, thousand hour modifications, this was as dry as it was going to get and as hot as it was going to get. And they decided to burn this area anywhere, anyway, and, it, and the other complicating factors other than what's said here is when you do that, it doesn't burn at all. It creates a floor and under that floor are the embers 
or in the shredded tree trunks that are still, the, the stones that are still standing, a place for embers to hide until a, a wind comes along to fan those embers or move them to another location. And as I've already shown you, or told you, that masticated fuel wasn't just in this area, it was outside. And once it got outside into the masticated fuel, as reported by, I believe it was Chief Rogers, the fire started going downhill, not uphill, at a rate that he's never seen. Roy, are you about to tell me something? Please take that one. These are some of these are some of the masticated fuels that we picked up from the site today. These are these are some of the masticated fuels. The point I'd like to point out is how there's little pockets inside these pieces of wood. These are close to the ground so they don't carry a lot of heat right away. But an ember can get in there and sit there and smolder for days. Um, I think Mr. Fieldy had some stumps on his property which were masticated that after the snow and the fire was out, was it 12 days, Jim? 12 days later, he noticed smoke coming out of one of the stumps on his property. Um, a response from the local fire department, the Intercanyon Fire Department, they came up and they spent several hours digging out that stuff to make sure that there's no heat left in there. So you've got a, a, a ground area covered with this sort of stuff with embers potentially buried in each one of these waiting for a wind event, which the wind event is not, it's rare, but it's not unprecedented. Anybody that's lived there for any period of time can tell you that six to 10 times a year we'll get winds that, of, of that, that nature. So it's something that in your contingency plans you should consider. So, and today on the, on the ground it was brought out that the behavior of fuel or the behavior of fire in masticated fuels is an unknown quantity. So why are we doing an experiment with an unknown quantity in the hottest, driest March on record in Colorado. <laughs> and now I have this black pile of stuff up here. <laughs> and I can't see my notes. <laughs> so, so please bear with me. So now we're going to talk about the monitoring activities. This is the weather report that was issued on the 21st of March. It was valid through the 26th of March. And as you'll notice on the, on the weather report, the area where our community is, is right in the very driest area, the area of the prescribed burn. In addition, it was also in the most extreme uh, fire risk. You remember smoking the bear and, oh, I love you. <laughs> Thank you. <laughs> actually, I think, actually, I think I've read everything, so rather than waste your battery. <laughs> uh, so, the point that we have here is not only you know, was what we saw in the news true, but there was a weather prediction that said this was going to be the hottest, driest time, and extreme caution was required. Um, Jack, do you want to add anything on what Jack read through all of the weather uh, reports that had occurred previously? Madam Chair, my name is Jack Ogg. I live up on Kester Road. And as Tom said, I've got reasonable experience uh, with weather and understanding as an AOA for 24 years. So, when, when I look at this, we saw a burn plan that perhaps wouldn't win a Nobel Prize, but, but it didn't work before. And then, you know, there's, there's never just one thing that causes a major catastrophe like this. There's always more than one. Well, we had the driest March on record. 
there was like the snow, which is usually about 10 inches here, was a trace for all of March. And now we've got weather reports. Now I the weather reports were not out of the ordinary on the day the prescribed burns was started. I refused to call it the control burn because it obviously wasn't. Um, but on Saturday, the weather report came out at 2, 2 in the afternoon that said, we're going to have wind gusts 50 miles an hour by Monday afternoon. Okay, that's fine. And then Sunday, they, they, took, they took it off because it wasn't out of trouble at that time. Um, but later in the afternoon, we came up with the weather, and this is an excerpt of the weather report on the right, and I won't bother going through because it's really boring. But the gusts were forecast to go to 50 miles an hour by the evening. And we're we'll flipping. Yeah, I got it. I got um, by, by Sunday, when, when they weren't there, but I assume they were manned out in Golden, the forecasts were were gusts to 30 by Sunday night, increasing to 55 by Monday afternoon. And like I said, the fire was not manned at all on Sunday. So there was nobody to look to see if there were any smokers or, or anything that was starting to get a little warm. Next. Next. Okay, so now, so now we get Monday morning. This is before anybody went to work, because the crew showed up at 10 o'clock. The 4.52 a.m. forecast called very windy conditions with gusts of 60 miles an hour. The National Weather Service also issued a red flag warning for that day. But still, they sent three people in an ATV down. And I asked somebody, well, don't you think that, that would rate more than three people? And the answer I got was maybe there weren't more available. Well, if there weren't more available, where, where was that planning? I don't know. I think there probably were more available. My personal opinion is, so everybody thought, you know, it's hoping, you know, it's going to get better, I hope it gets better, we won't have a fire, and we'll all look okay. Well, as it turned out, Mother Nature decided that the wind was going to pick it up, and in other words, there were, um, there were people that said that when it, when it broke, firemen were on scene, the one of those three guys, that it just looked like fireflies running across the land when that wind picked up. And it'd pick a bunch of embers up out of the stump and it'd blow it. It'd blow it 1,500 feet or so and where the fire finally caused this thing was. It was downhill. I live, I'm very fortunate, my house was not burned. I live probably a mile into the wind where my house is, a lot closer in another area, but from where the closest fire was. And I found from, from, from Roy's, probably Roy's property, I found a piece of bar this big, it was totally charred and burned. Fortunately, it landed on the side of the driveway that, that I had totally cleared all the brush from. If it had landed on the other, it would, it would burn. So this stuff can travel a long way, but to just get three people, if they had 30 out there, like they did the first couple days when they were training, this probably wouldn't happen. So this is Saturday, the day Jack was talking about the weather's the weather predictions were already beginning to uh, show increases, and the uh, the Forest Service person who had gone out to monitor the fire that day from about 10 o'clock, 10:30 in the morning, uh, left around 2 o'clock in the afternoon, said there was minimal smoke uh, in the burn area. Well, this is from uh, a picture taken from up near Kester Road. It's about two miles away. This is what the controlled burn looked like to us when it was going. And it most certainly isn't a small amount of smoke in an area. There were plumes of smoke. And as a result, as was said earlier, somebody turned in a uh, fire alarm uh, and, and there were fire engines uh, responding to that. Even with this amount of smoke, the Forest Service decided to not monitor the burn site on Sunday. 
And, uh, and being a Boy Scout, the thing we heard was where there's smoke, there's fire. Uh, there was at least heat, and those embers needed to be put out. So, truth in advertising. This is not our burn. However, this is the kind of equipment that was there on Monday when the wildfire started uh, to be able to control the burn. But most importantly, what I'd like to do is call your attention to this quote at the top. Chief Rogers again, and he was responding to that uh, call that I told you about, and the Forest Service told them to stand down, despite the fact that there was as much smoke as I showed you, and said, we've already been there and checked it out, and it's not a problem. Fire was unmanned from then, we've talked about that, and Jack just showed you about the 50 mile an hour winds that were kicking up. And they still maintain three men to go in and, and mop up without any backup plan, any reasonable backup plan or resources. Shouldn't at a very minimum, shouldn't there have been some change to the plan for monitoring to increase our, uh, our uh, capabilities as opposed to decreasing them? talking about the extended mop-up uh, patrol plan. Active mop-up will occur on the second day as necessary and will again be focused on security or of the unit. Following that, mop-up efforts will focus on any remaining heavy smoke producing fuels further interior to the unit. Mop-up, I already read you, most prescribed burns don't occur. On a burn day, they occur days afterwards. With respect to the actual wildfire, there were problems with communications that we noted listening to the documents, to the uh, recorded communications. But most importantly, as I said before, Chief Rogers, the identified from the uh, North Forks uh, Volunteer Fire Department, identified the need for the evacuation trigger points at 2.30 in the afternoon when he arrived. And, and the transcripts of his reports say that evacu the evacuation notice is imminent. It was already racing down the hill toward that area that I talked to you about on the previous pictures. For some reason, there was no evacuation notice sent for more than two hours after those trigger points were identified and after it had already passed those trigger points based on Chief McLaughlin's testimony of what was there when he arrived. In addition, uh, because of the evacuation notice, the reverse 911 call went out. And uh, we heard this morning that, uh, that those are uh, um, automatic, automated calls. Uh, however, many of those calls went to the wrong addresses, places all the way down in Morrison, and many more did not go to the residents up on the hill. In fact, although there were promises when, when my neighbors called in on, uh, on 2911 asking what was going on, they, and, and they had been told it's just a prescribed burn as late as 3 o'clock. Um, uh, they were told that if anything changed, they would get a call back. Some of the neighbors that made those calls were the Lucases in Ann Apple. Now, again, in my business, if I'm going to do operate, if I'm going to have a critical emergency system necessary in case I have a problem, I have to do operational testing of that asset to make sure it works correctly. Obviously, it didn't work correctly. So as you're looking at what went wrong, 
Good, yeah, a good question is, was operational testing done? And if it was, why didn't it identify these flaws so that this won't ever happen to some other community? So what caused this tragedy? We talked about the three things that, uh, the three major areas, planning, monitoring, and reaction. We summarized for you what we think were the critical things that, uh, that were not taken care of in this. We pointed out that disasters don't usually occur as a result of one thing, it's a number of things. We're hoping that as you're delving into the details of what went wrong, uh, you'll be able to find the answers to the questions that we've tried to pose this evening. You also asked us to, or, or said you needed to address the financial impact of the community. We've had numerous appraisers come in and talk to us. We've had reclamation experts come in and talk to us. We've had uh, foresters come in and talk about tree removal costs. And uh, Jim Philby has gone out and he's done his own review of Buffalo Creek Fire and the High Mountain Fire. And what we found is, from those experts in our own review, is that there's a range of what the impact is for the land devaluation. For properties like Jack Ogg's, where he didn't have an immediate uh, burning on his property, uh, it can be as low as 15%. They call it stigmatization. For those of us that uh, lost everything, like Scott Apple, who really lost everything, it can be as high as 75%. Reclamation costs, to bring the land back to something like it used to be, although it will never be brought back to what it was. Uh, on normal uh, land with little slope, it's about $2,000 to $5,000 an acre, depending on the amount of burn that occurred. Uh, on the other hand, for properties like mine that happen to have some of the steepest slopes and were in the hottest part of the burn, They've told us that it's seven to twelve thousand dollars an acre. Uh, and finally, uh, Jim was able to get some estimates. Uh, the first estimate is really mine. And on the area where we need to remove trees so that uh, there is no safety risk to the people doing the demolition or the people hopefully rebuilding our house. It's about $130 per tree. And as I said, this is a nominal slope. In fact, hardly any slope, any slope. On the other hand, uh, Jim has estimates up to $10,500 an acre. Um, and that's if the trees can be marketed. As you heard this morning, that's a big if. I think Senator Roberts, I think you told us that uh, it was in your area that the one remaining timber operation uh, is there and it's a, uh, uh, it's in, what is it called? I'm sorry? Receivership. Receivership. And so I'm not sure where we're going to be able to go put those trees. Finally, I'd like to talk for a moment. And this is not to take anything away from the horror that our neighbors have gone through in Waldo Canyon in the High Park fire. But this is a different situation in what we've been faced with compared to what they've been faced with. In addition to the horror that they face, we are facing a situation where we've had to go to the state capitol, to the governor's office, giving testimony numerous times, again tonight, uh, to try and get the bureaucracy to step up to their responsibility for timely responsibility for what happened in a fire that was started by, uh, by the state, and I should say the Forest Service because it's not the whole state. The Wall of Canyon fire occurred a month ago. The governor already requested and received FEMA funds for its victims. 
thank goodness. The High Park fire occurred two months ago. The state is already spending funds to reseed and mitigate that area to prevent erosion and to restore the land. And we're in a situation where there's been no commitment made to the victims, despite the two bills that we just heard tonight from the Attorney General. There's been no funding support offered to help us out in rebuilding our community. There's been no mitigation or reforestation support, despite the fact that when we talked to the governor, he said we ought to check with the, uh, the uh, state forest service and figure out what can be done with that. I guess our bottom line is, where's the accountability for what happened in the fire? And we just want to get on with our lives and stop going through this turmoil. And, and have some help for something that we didn't cause so we can get back to the way we were. And I thank you for your time. Regarding that, and they 
and said, well, the weather system seemed to be funneled through certain canyons, and uh, some areas are just stronger than others. Well, this area is one of them. And uh, we get some strong winds coming through that area. And with the southern slope that we had, and the dry conditions that we had, it was just uh, a recipe for disaster if that fire was able to get away. Uh, in a statement, it was said, it is difficult to forecast the winds in that area because of the terrain. It has always been known as a difficult wind area. That was not my statement, but I agree with it 100%. That came from Rocco Snark when he was being investigated uh, by the Jefferson County uh, Sheriff's Office. And uh, I'll read it again because it's really, really important to me that that uh, Snark, sta Snark stated, it is difficult to forecast the wind in the area because of the terrain. It has always been known as a difficult wind area. The next point I'd like to make is that uh, on another part in that investigation, uh, the fire burn boss said in that same investigation, and it's all on public record, the interior of the unit was left to, be, uh, to burn itself out. I can give you the paragraph and page where that was. The interior of the unit was left to be burned to burn itself out. A little later on in his, in his statement, he states uh, he believes that he did everything in his power to make sure that prescribed burn was cold and out. Now, which which was it? I mean, in your prescribed burn, do you let it burn out on its own, or do you make sure it's in it's cold and it's out? I think as this committee, we should maybe talk about or instruct or do something to say to people, this is what we need it to be. I hope it's the latter, that it's cold and it's out. My last point, or near my last point, was at what point does a controlled burn swap over become an out of control forest fire. At a distance of two miles with uh, 2,000 feet elevation between the fire prescribed burn and the top of the, where Kester Road is, Andy Hoover had measured with his instruments that the wind was moving at 79 miles an hour. Others were indicating 55 to 60 miles an hour. Uh, if we're only two miles away, and uh, the winds are moving at a round number of 60 miles an hour, that means uh, it takes two minutes to move from the prescribed burn area to the Kester Road area. In that wind that's howling, uh, there's embers as Jack had indicated and so on. You don't have a whole lot of time to make up a decision. Do we evacuate those people or not? And uh, when you burn that close to population or residence, you need to have uh, an early warning system somehow, and uh, I don't think that was in place at this particular time. I saw pictures this morning of many firemen and equipment on the scene of a fire that was put on the presentation on the screen. And, and another picture of very few men and equipment on the scene. It's funny they didn't show any uh, pictures of no equipment and no fire and uh, no equipment and no men on the scene when the fire is still burning or smoking. Smoke could be seen from at least two miles away, as was indicated in that picture. No one was there. Your committee must recommend that they can never. This can never happen again. Lastly, all fires are horrific. What I can not get my head around is the fact that this fire was instigated by the Colorado Forest Service. The end result were three people killed, many people tra traumatized, and tens of millions of dollars in losses. 
We will never be the same again. Thank you. Thank you. Fire towers that are south of us. 
I've, I've sort of have a list in my address book of people that I can call when I don't get enough information and websites that I can go to. And on that day, I had more than a dozen websites pulled up. I was checking constantly in, in between the 911 calls. I feel like I did everything in my power, including contacting as many neighbors as I knew were home that day to try to figure out how we could get information. So my fury is the fact that as a citizen of that community, knowing that there had been that prescribed burn, knowing the danger that they were placing us in, that there was no way for us to get information. And perhaps they thought that information uh, would be dangerous for us, that we would overreact. What would be the worst thing that would happen? We would have gotten out of there earlier. And to learn later that at 2.30 they knew that we should have been evacuated, that it was on a scanner, we've, we've heard it, that at 2.30 they were saying we should have been evacuated. What happened in that time frame in between? And as I was talking to 911, I was realizing these are not people who know our situation. When I had to describe to them where on the map they can find my road, I expect better service from my 911. I expect to be, I expect to feel a little bit safer and looked out for by the people. This is the service that we're supposed to be provided. These people should be helping us. They should be giving us the proper information. Now I can't blame the 911 individuals. Clearly, they weren't getting the information. So on that day, I realized this system that I have held true, <laughs> that I believe there is a system that supports and helps us, I, I think it's, it's, it's very faulty. And I don't think that we can trust it. And so if you were to ask me right now, do I feel safe in my own community? The answer is absolutely not. I don't feel like it's, it's fallen apart. I don't feel like I have that safety. I can trust my own instinct better than I can trust the information that I'm getting from people. So that said, um, the day On that afternoon, uh, I was, um, you, you might say if I was smelling smoke, I wasn't going to have to be in the family. Maybe part of it was because I was being told not to worry. One of the 911 operators told me that I shouldn't call every time I smell smoke. That's the kind of sort of condescension I'm talking about. So I'm trying to get information. My husband and the kids are <coughs> gently packing things. He was a little more trusting than me. He said, you know, don't contact us. In the past, we've been on alert to be evacuated. And, um, you know, we had, we had someone come down the driveway. That's how we heard before. We just assumed that information was going to come to us. So we trusted it. Um, and kept on the websites. And, and finally, we were listening to um, Pine Camp. There was a man on Pine Camp, a waterman from Evergreen. Bless his heart, because he, that's how we learned about the evacuation. Um, he posted it on Pine Camp. And that's how we did, and that's why we got out. And that's all that we had. And so throughout the day, when there had been prescribed burns and um, other burns, the High Meadow, the, um, many other fires that had blown in our direction from the southwest, human fire. We have had the smoke, we've had the smell, we've had all the same symptoms that we were experiencing on the day of, on Monday. And so we're looking at distance, time frame, wind, and, and what we see in the sky, and that's what we had to go from. And so at the point when we finally saw the evacuation notice, in my memory, that is when the sky notably changed. And it went from something that we had seen many times before to something we had never seen before. And we had a very short window to jump in the car. Pray to God, all my children were in the car with three kids. And I was in the car in front, and we flew out of there. And then we, all we could think about was the rest of our neighbors further down the road. If we're barely making it up, do they know? Because they're, they're dropped down on the backside of the mountain. And I know that they didn't have the same visibility that we had. And so what are you thinking about? All, how do you live that night knowing that all their neighbors may not have gotten out? And clearly they didn't. And so in, in the time following you, well, I was just going to go through sort of, um, in, in general, life since this, we lost an outbuilding, we lost uh, cords of firewood, we lost, we had some uh, lot property damage, a lot of trees burned, nothing compared to what our neighbors went through. We feel extremely lucky. You know, uh, as Jack was talking about the large chunks, we had chunks like this in our, we have uh, 10.8 acres, and we had, you know, they say these things were blowing at 1,000 feet. The ridge at the top of our driveway is where the fire, it, the road acted as a break of some sort, but for 1,000 feet, that was shooting over into our property, so we had, 
people up there who actually stay and help to save our home, and without them, it wouldn't be there at all. But there are large patches of bird, and to come up in the week following, um, when the sheriff allowed us to come up, and we could grab a few, three, a few things, um, you know, it's just it's just all black, and to see the home standing was just it was an absolute miracle. And we have our neighbors to thank for that, and the firefighters that came up the car. But in the time following that, you know, we're, uh, my daughter enters therapy at school, and she's not sleeping, and the kids are extremely traumatized. They're 13, they're 9, and they're 4, so they're all going to process at very different rates. I'm a wreck. Uh, I can't remember to pick my kids up at school. I have to put little notes up on the refrigerator at the hotel so that I can remember to pick them up up the road. And um, so short-term memory gone, no food, no sleep. You know, and we're, we're the people who made it with our home. And all these other people, I don't even know what they went through. We've tried to support each other as much as possible. This is more than devastating. On July 7th, I had an hour when I sat and I actually found myself smiling and I had a strange sensation. I wasn't sure what it was. And it was just a moment of contentment. Like suddenly I wasn't in a hole. And it happened one day for one hour on July 7th and I wrote it down. And that's what this life, that's what it's been like since this. So, um, the prescribed burn, I mean, obviously, where I feel things failed, I think the prescribed burn was a mistake. It was a terrible mistake. And Tom did an excellent job explaining in every way how that was a huge mistake. I don't think I have anything to add to that. Um, um, so I'll, I'll just walk you through that. got me very quick. And uh, I do appreciate uh, you giving us this chance to talk to you. Um, you know, our, our, we, we uh, as she said, we had a, um, one of our neighbors, like one of the uh, members of our community was posting on our webpage um, basically what he was hearing on scan. We don't own a scanner. Um, so my, you know, one, one recommendation would be to, you know, it, there is a, a webpage where uh, the sheriff, where, where she was directed to look for information. And when we looked at it, the latest post was like March of 2011. Uh, you know, so I, I'm not exactly sure what the latest post was, but it was almost a year and a half old, and that's supposed to be our source to get some information. So, you know, the, the, it, the good news is that there is something there of Adam's is that is really being used. Um, so it was actually just some member of our community that we, it was the only reason we knew to, to leave. It was a, uh, you know, a post by a member of our community at 5 o'clock saying mandatory request for evacuation. Uh, our video of our escape was at 526. So from the time that that was posted, we had, you know, we were basically, I had already been packing bags, of course, but, um, you know, you, you sort of go into a mode where you're like, oh, I'm never going to, oh, the videos of the kids, you know, whatever, you, you start thinking of things that you're going to lose. You know, and so we're grabbing things, and my son's running him out to the car, and uh, he comes in once, and I looked at them five minutes before, it looked the same as the Haman fire, the Haman fire, we just saw smoke. Within five minutes, uh, you know, it had gotten very dark, and my son comes in and says the trash falling out of the sky. And you know, um, you know, the kids are getting the cats. You know, we uh, we got a ladder room to get get out of the house. Um, and I remember uh, we have a puppy that isn't very well trained yet, and I was thinking if he runs away. You know, so I remember like my daughter was going to take him. I'm like, don't you know, be careful. I, but I, when I walked outside, I mean, we saw the flames on the bridge, I and mean, we were, you know, it was really, really uh, close. Yeah, and I mean the sound I and mean, everything. We basically, I yelled in the house of candles, like that's it, we're out. You know, she comes down the corner, a box of pictures. You know, just things that you you think you have more time to do. We got in the car, um, you know, and drove out. You know, obviously you've seen the video. Um, you know, the um, the, the uh, feeling that I've had is that from her 911 calls and from the reassurances that we got that it was a control burn, there was nothing to worry about to stop calling. We felt, you know, that, or at least I felt, they'll keep us safe. These are our people that we trust with these decisions, and that you're overreacting. I mean, you know, <laughs> talked about this afterwards. That, and um, you know, obviously, our trust in that those systems has been, you know, damaged. Um, but again, thanks for letting us talk. About that. I, I just, I think, to say one last thing, the a few words that occurred to me on the way over is that I feel this whole thing has been responsibility or action that's been retroactive and not proactive. And if we're going to live in these mountains and feel safe, we need to take proactive steps in that to, to ensure safety. 
And that means taking the steps to see if that, I mean, if we can do a test of the emergency broadcasting system on the radio, can't we figure out a system where people can see that? There should be, that system should be in place. It's, it's a no-brainer. So we need certain things, and we need to feel safe. Controllers, 
prescribed burn, it's not worth the risk. Three, three people uh, lost their lives, 25 homes. The potential was a, a lot greater. And uh, on a personal note, uh, you cannot insure vacant land. I've got 360 acres that it would be worthless. It was, and uh, you can't insure vacant land. Um, and, well, I'll make this short. I'm uh, down with prescribed burns forever. able to X out a bunch of what I was planning to write. Um, I just, I, it's been four months and 17 days since I lost my home, my barn, our tractor barn, and virtually all the trees on our property are 35 acres and beyond. And as you've heard, we, we lost the fabric of our neighborhood, a very fine neighborhood. I have to as well as three wonderful neighbors. So, where are we now? My husband, Tom, and me. I just wanted to paint you a, a, a simple picture of a, of a not so simple life. You know, John Denver's song says, uh, some days are diamonds, some days are stones. I've been having a lot of stones. And I'm sure everybody here has as well. It's getting better. I mean, you, you have to take some steps forward. And the kindness and generosity of friends, um, neighbors, total strangers, and, and just the overall community has been um, a blessing. Humbling, comforting, and pretty amazing. Um, but it, it's a, it truly is a battle to not be moody, angry, depressed, sleep still comes with some difficulty, it was worse early on, but you still wake up in the middle of the night sometimes and you can't let it go. The stress on marriage is palpable. <laughs> you know, I'm not telling you anything new. <laughs> the endless time doing insurance inventory. By the way, is Mr. Blake still here? Yes. I, I appreciate the fact that you're nudging us to get our notice of claim in. We know we need to do that. That one slide that Tom had up there, um, I'm not making excuses, but I want you to be aware that we are working furiously on doing our, our inventory. You know, we have our, our home structure. We have to inventory every single thing in our house and give a projection of what the replacement cost would be. In addition, the, uh, the land values, you know, Jim Fieldy has worked very hard on that. Coming up with numbers for removing all the, the dead wood and perhaps replanting. It's taken a heck of a lot of time, so it's not something, when you said it's just one page, we know it's just one page, but when we looked at what we had to put on it, it takes a heck of a lot of time. No excuses, we want to get it in, and we're definitely going to do it before the deadline. Um, we've also been getting bids on, on work done on the burned out property, moving into a rental home, dealing with animals in a rental home, somebody else's home, or on somebody else's ranch. My horses are on um, one of my wonderful neighbors. Um, just trying to remember what I did 15 minutes ago. Does anybody else have a hard time with your memory these days? Yeah. It's, it's really mind-boggling. We, we completed building our home five years ago. It was our dream home. It said that when one is building a home that you make it takes 64,000 decisions in building a home. It sort of feels like that right now. 
and except that there's really no um, prize, no dessert, no home at the very end of this whole thing. And, and then the thought of doing it all over again is mind-numbing as well. And I find that when I'm not physically on my property, I, I think, yeah, here I go. You know, I, I love my neighborhood. I love my neighbors. I want to be there again. And then when I'm not there, uh, sometimes that picture changes, some doubts surface, because we're looking at thousands of black trees. You saw them today. The expense of cutting and removing all those trees. The question that I will feel living in a house, looking at trees that are no longer that are not on my property. You know, we we actually border on Denver Waterports, so we're going to be looking at Denver Waterports property. Do you think they're going to come cut their trees down? Probably not. I I'm I'm kind of curious to know, and you don't have to answer me because I I suspect I do know. Uh, how you felt today when you were looking at these burned out properties. Were you able to put yourself in our shoes? What would you do? How would you feel? I really hope that you'll keep that in the backs of your minds. And we look towards the state with some trepidation right now. Um, we know we've been wronged. Not just Tom and me. Our neighborhood. We know we've been wronged. I think you know that we've been wronged. And we love Colorado. We want to remain in Colorado. We ask your help in restoring our faith in our Colorado government and helping us to move forward in the most positive way. Thanks.
as a result of that, as one whole, I don't have that giving. Not so much in a monetary, in a sense, but in an emotional sense. Um, my parents were rocks. They um, were able to guide me through some difficult situations. They were always there to help. They were always willing to, to um, talk to me on the phone. They were also always willing to talk to my kids on the phone. My kids would call them, and now they don't have that opportunity. My parents also, I think, in addition to the community up on Kester Road, there was also a community outside of that. There were schools there too. My the house that they they built, like the scan was like probably anybody else that we'll talk to. This was their dream home. My dad, early on as a child, as a child, I remember my dad working two jobs. And finally he got to that point where he retired. He built his home up there 17 years ago and it was his dream home. As a result, it was almost a retreat. Um, it was a place we gathered for holidays. Last Thanksgiving, we probably had 30 some people crammed into that house. It was chaotic, but it was fun. Um, Mountain Vista High School, FCA, for the past five, five, six, seven years, used that as a retreat um, for no charge. My parents would just say, just come on up, do whatever you want to, no worries. So they were giving back to the community, um, they were giving back to their church, and now that doesn't exist. So there's all of these holes right now. So what am I looking for, I guess, for closure, to help fill some of those holes? As Tom said, he said they're narrow and bright. Right? Yeah, these are definitely deep. I guess what I would like to see is truth. Um, some of the questions people have already asked, um, but questions, for example, so why was there somebody on Sunday? Don't tell me that there wasn't anybody. Tell me why. What was the rationale behind that? What was the rationale for having this burn on the dry march? Don't tell me, yeah, it was a dry march. We decided to have it. Tell me. Why we didn't? Why? What was the rationale? You know, if, I'm hoping that people are strong enough and willing to take the accountability that says, yeah, we did it for monetary reasons. You know, that was our rationale. Okay, I can accept that. We'll like it. But that's the way it is because at the end of the day, as Tom talked about, it's all about risk, right? You take the risk, and sometimes you have to pay for this. So I'm just open for truth and um, just like to thank you for this time.
have my questions. I want to know what was the objective of Denver Water Board and its contractor, the Colorado State Forest Service, that required that this prescribed burn should take place, especially in the conditions that it took place. What was that all important objective? What was the benefit of that important objective that made it worth starting an inherently dangerous bar? What was the objective and what was the benefit? Thirdly, what was the risk to Denver Water Board to leave that ground unburned? This mark. I believe you may find that there was a very low risk, and maybe there was a different reason for the fire, different reason that it was started. Number four, I would like the commission to follow the money trap. What is the money trap? I would like to know if it's acceptable for the Denver Water Board and its contractor with the Colorado State Forest Service to take the least expensive and most dangerous alternative to achieve this objective, whatever it was, that was so important. And to do so without warning or even asking the very people they endanger. We did nothing wrong. Can the state forest service say the same? My last question is, is there one thing that's okay about what's been done to us and what we're left to deal with? Uh, 
I'm not a public speaker, so this is my own personal battle to be up here. I can't reach the microphone because I'm so short. <laughs> <laughs> so, but the charge is... Oh, thank you. The charge is to make recommendations to the state legislator to the state legislature later in 2013. And so I would like to talk just very, very briefly about the State Forest Service and the protocol that was conceived in 1994. It was referred to as the decision of science, the art and science of making choices for desired change. The system was based on the following criteria. Seven points. Number one, accurately describing the problem and the criteria for solving it. They failed. Number two, uses available information effectively. Again, they failed. Point number three, collects new information wisely. Grossly failed. Point number four, generates and chooses from a wide range of alternatives. They failed again. Point number five, distinguishes facts, myths, values, and unknowns. That was not done. Point number six, describes consequences associated with alternative problem solutions. That wasn't even thought of. And the last point, leads to choices that are consistent with personal, organizational, stakeholder, and other important values. Well, it is my personal belief that the U.S. Forest Ser Service needs to go back to their own reference books, such as Dawes, 1988, Automatic and Controlled Decision, decision Making Processes, or Bosman Decision Quality Concepts, because they totally lost what they were trying to do. And they, they impacted us so greatly. Every day, our life is now seeing my friends and my neighbors in a series <coughs> of different levels of trauma. And we all go through it. We all understand. Sometimes we can't think. Sometimes we can't speak. Sometimes we can't get through the day. We're all left in emotional wreckage. And we are just trying to, to recover from this, and we require your assistance, because you are our voices. And we really appreciate you taking the time for us. And thank you very much.
that God has given us when we we can profit from this, we can let it down on a fire. I have no intention of letting this get me down. I got to thinking, what would happen if my property? Well, I know I've got a lot of trees here, about five and a half acres, and I have about, um, I was just about 3,500 trees on them. If that burn, I'd have a hell of a view. There'll be a view of hell. That's what you're left with. You look around uh, some of the other places. I took a trip recently by all the various fire areas. They're all the same. All the bad. Now this uh, fire occurred in March. In May, middle of May, I scheduled to give a talk at a convention in Dayton, Ohio. And this convention was amateur radio operators, which I've been for over 50 years. And my talk was, I wanted to show how amateur radio operators could have aided in this uh, fire. Uh, not many people don't know much about amateur radio operators anymore. They were kind of a dying breed, I guess. But I looked at the topography of the same, and I knew that there was a type of aerial that could be used. You could send a picture out from one of those canyons. I was going to ask some of the women that did those presentations. When you had that presentation, what was your view of how you were informed about what was happening? No oh, one Yes. Now, how could we help? I think I have a camera. I can take a picture of it. I can send you a picture. Uh, what is the characteristic? If we, if we look at what happened that night when it was fire, that would have prevented it fire from ever even occurring. Well, they said over and over, they had a little smoke fire. Well, I can send you a picture of a deep can with a special camera. Uh, this is where I was sitting there. I see a couple of cameras. I wish I was there, you could pick those up. Yes, yeah. these are some cameras. And they're at one level. They're on my brain. Now, I can take a tree, I can send a picture back, by a special format, anywhere. It will bounce off the top set over 240 miles up in the sky called NBIS technical. But nonetheless, I could monitor that signal with no problem. Um, another thing that happened, people always were claiming to you wonder how our house is doing. Oh, we got all kinds of things we know. What kind of possibilities that they can do research? And what funding do I have? We uh, have a controlled burn. We say we don't like controlled burn. Well, what happens all that fuel, smoking barrels home, has to burn. But another way of doing it, you pick it up and throw it away. What has happened, they have cut out all funding in our county for more inflation. So now what? Now we have a new condition. Tell them to go. So if you don't want control burdens, there are a way of getting rid of this stuff. So I would say, minimal. 
cost of this in terms of property loss is just noise level compared to what the cost of that county was for a slash removal. You say you got pickled wings? I know you got pickled wings because I know how the uh, atmosphere works for my studies. The uh, atmosphere around a wind generates its own uh, atmosphere and fire. And I guess I did wrong. I um, always that sharp right now. But anyway, the uh, control fire or a forest fire generates its own climate. It generates storms, it generates electricity, and everything else. And when I gave a talk similar to this in uh, Dayton, Ohio, I also attended a talk by the home security people. And they are more concerned that a terrorist could start something. Well, not be one burn, a mobile burn. How are you going to have a mobile burn? We had a problem with one burn. What are you going to do with everything burn? Why? We have to have a, a total new concept. No, I'm sorry. This is not, not my show. This is your show. I have a, a blue set of slides. This is not my show. You better like to have it. I have to help you out. Thank you.
many people knew the fire was out of control. Why, why, um, why was the evacuation not called? What happened in all those different agencies where the problems were, were occurred that allowed this to happen? And I, I guess I would, I would ask that, and again, this isn't my home, and, but, but she was part of our family, and she's missed by so many of us. Um, but I think before we move forward to say what needs to happen for the future, what can we do to prevent this in the future, we need to answer the questions from these families who are all left without any answers of who made those decisions, who, where is the accountability, where, where are the answers for all, starting from before the control burn, on the control burn day, or the prescriber day, and all throughout the process. Those, I don't, I don't know why, if there's a cover-up or there have to be answers there for what, what happened all along the way from, from Thursday through the tragedy of Monday. Um, so I would just ask you that I understand, I live in Jefferson County as well with, with my husband and children and I have many friends and, and um, loved ones in this whole area and of course we want to, to resolve what needs to change for our safety in the future. But we have to answer, I think, the questions for all of these families who are left without homes, without family members. We, we just can't move on to the next step until we resolve this for them. I, I would ask that our committee would, would really make a point to uncover the things that haven't been uncovered to date. And also, just what I learned today that, that um, really breaks my heart for all these people who don't have homes, don't have money, are, you know, are, left, are left in an unthinkable situation if we were all to put ourselves in those shoes. Um, it's very disappointing to hear that, that I thought that a bill was passed that would allow this to be a quick, relatively quick, painless procedure for them, and, and now it sounds like maybe not, and maybe it's a long, drug-out process with, with no clarity, with no knowledge for them, no assurance of, of how long it will take, etc. So I hope that that is not the case. I hope that we can come to resolution sooner rather than later to give them some kind of, of assurance um, of, of what they can count on. They need to have something to count on. It. And it's, you know, they've put up with a lot so far, all the, all the work that they've done to try to deal with insurance and deal with, with all the things that they have talked about. Um, I would just ask that we keep that in mind, first and foremost, that we really deal with these people in this fire and then we move on to to what we need to do for all the rest of us so we can feel secure because I, I feel the same as Kim. I don't I don't have any confidence at this point that 911 would work, that reverse 911 would work, that the fire department would be there. I don't have any of those those assurances in my life where I live in the mountains in Jefferson County. So um, I, I do appreciate your committee. Um, I wish you the best. I hope that we can really ask the hard questions as uncomfortable as they may be and get the answers that we need so we can move forward. Thank you very much.
No, on the, on the floor. I've heard a lot of emotions mentioned. One I have not heard that you need to understand is the profound anger that some of us have in this. But it's the last note. I believe, given the circumstances we're faced with, that it's absolutely you, as the, our representatives, and as leaders of the government, of our state to confront the issue of what is adequate and sufficient restitution for things that have been taken that cannot be returned. And I'm thinking particularly of the lives that have been taken. And I think that you need to take the lead in that and in the process of healing that I don't think is hard to be done. That needs to. We're looking for that leadership. Thank you. Thank you. And uh, that is the last one that I have signed up, but I certainly want to open it up if anybody who didn't sign up yet and would like to speak. And we'll just need you to sign up before you meet. My name is Beth Sunkin Hope, and I live at 184 75 County Road 96, which is Drew Road. I also have a home at Elk Ridge and Kessler Road, next to Jim Fieldy. My our home and the two homes on each side of us survived and were saved by the first responders. <coughs> I know why you're here. I know why we're here. And it's wrong. And we don't have Colorado State Forest Service here, and we don't have the water board here. We have people that want to talk to them, you guys, and all of us. So hopefully on your August 22nd meeting, that happens. Whether it's because we all petition them to get out, whether it's because they begin to have pressure from you and realize you need answers to get your lives. For the lives and the breath that are lived by these people that have lost some things and everything, every day that goes by is daunting on our spirits because we want somebody to forgive. Because ultimately, we're all human and we all make mistakes. And we can't even find anybody to talk to us that did this. Which is why this is our testimony in film. And in this, because nobody else has asked us. So we are so delighted that you're here. And they're not 
right here to talk about it. And that's not right. Because that means, just like up to now, they're sort of ignoring us. And hopefully they won't be able to be with you. No notification for me is where it starts. Because if we got a letter that said, there's a risk coming, we who you depend on want you to know the risk. We want you to share it. We want you to know the boundaries. We want you to know deep. We want you to have a phone number to call somebody and ask about. The little orange signs that are on the road, they do not have a phone number. Like she said, I don't she's still here. If it said learn this Thursday, what does that mean to us? It means that we're all going to be scared from moving from now on if we see signs and say anything about that. Um, as we have found, no monitoring in those days was very key. I don't know if I made that call. We know from here on out it's going to be a different call because our fire chief here is going to has made sure your local department is going to have the last call of whether or not the burn should happen. Should have been that way before. Hopefully. It will be followed that way from here and now. To not have a contingency plan, to not believe that there was an escape possible, goes to the same thing of not giving us notice. They didn't take it seriously enough. They didn't value our lives enough to do those things. To give us a contact person. Your protocol says they could have an information specialist there, say at Fox and Road and Running Deer, to answer questions. Well, that would go along with a phone number if you had a phone number to call somebody. We didn't have those things. You have your animals, your trailers for your animals. You don't travel maybe for your job. If these things are known, you stay put because we have seen what the Forest Service has done here in our state and what they haven't done in responsibility sometimes. And to have an October 13, 2011 activity for this whole prescribed area in Black Lion those gentlemen or people on that day, they themselves on the 13th had two slop overs right there that day. And they had to clean up. And then they left. And two whole days later, those embers were still alive and there was a wind event. And the foresters had to get called in again by our local sheriff's that lived down there in Minnesota. That, again, they weren't responsible enough to feel around to stay. Two days later, the wind event pulled it up again, and it was a fire. That Sir Rogers and the North Fork Fire Department took care of. That's not right. Um, I, I do believe community input and involvement from here on out in any prescribed burn in Colorado will make a difference. People won't die. Hopefully. People shouldn't have died this time. If, if the people that had died had, had noticed, had a, a risk analysis, something in paper that said, if possible, that the fire can escape. Well, they would not have just continued to fall back. They would have left. Because it's your gut feeling. You know there's a risk. You don't get the right answer. You don't wait. You don't. Not anymore. We're not going anymore. We've learned that. And if it's their lives that um, we're taking so that we weren't at any better than it really good. It's a really good thing. They don't have a voice, so we have to be their voice. And their voice is involve your local support, involve people who live around it. And I hope with our new setup or with a division of fire safety under public safety, I hope the change is about to be big and here. Because these people in this community aren't going to allow it to go. We, we aren't going to allow more people to die. Because we couldn't stop this one. We can stop, stop anything else that's not right in the future.
you might think of too. Common sense was lacking here. We who live here have common sense. We know what wind events can do. We know what dry, dry conditions can do. Why is it that our common sense didn't fall all the way down or up? The people that were doing it, that were making calls, they don't know, and that's what we need to find out. We're here to help you, and you're here to help us. So we're in it together. Our roots will go deeper. Can't say we're thankful for that at all. We're thankful for community and the change that we hope to do potentially. So thank you.
I just ask that you guys could maybe get something going with the money. And it's not all about money, but it helps. It would just help so much. And so I've written a few checks, but nothing like what I'd like. So God bless you all.
And one of the firefighters says, hey, tell that guy to get lost. So he comes back over to me and says, they don't want you around. You're going to be in the way. And I said, you know, arrest me now, but I'm going to help find this fire. So we go marching up the hillside, and sure enough, there's a fire at the base of the tree that got struck by lightning. That's about a three-foot circle. And the firefighters have a shovel and a pick, and that's it. And they're stirred up this dry pine straw that's been dry for six months, and they're, they're, they're not doing any good. And I'm standing there with a two-gallon bucket of water. Finally, one of them looks at me and says, hey, why don't you pour some water here? And I go, okay. So I pour a little water for it. We finally put this fire out with a two-gallon bucket of water I brought. How can you show up to a fire without any water? So anyway, we put the fire out. My kids and I go get warm buckets of water, pour it at the base of two other trees that got struck by lightning. And I left that day, and I walked down the mountain. It was about 150 yards from my house. And who do I run into that pulls up my driveway just then? I see Scott Apple. These people I've talked to, at least a dozen of them that have lost their homes, personally. And this bill that's been passed makes no sense to be lumped together with some litigation that a bunch of insurance companies have started. These people should not be forced to be involved with that. This is a separate item. This is a separate issue. So, Mr. Blake, if you can speak to your Attorney General or whoever is going to make those decisions, something should be done to separate the insurance litigation from these people whose lives have been devastated and ruined. That's all I have to say. You know, actually, is it something new? I, I think what we need to do is close out but we do, I want to remind you of the other ways to reach us, which again is email. Perhaps we now have our website. I'm Paul Pope, Legislative Council staff. Uh, the best way that I'd be able to, for us to get in contact with you, uh, you're going to see folks with red badges here uh, in the back right here, right here. Um, we can help, we aim to help uh, keep the lines of communication open uh, with, the, uh, with the commission. Um, there's a, the, the feedback form in the back has our uh, email address. Uh, Reagan is holding it up in the back of the room. We have cards. We can help you navigate the website. That would probably be the easiest way. So if you want to uh, see us afterward, uh, we uh, have phone numbers, uh, an email address. We've spoken to some of you by phone and by email already. So. Any questions, see us at the meeting. Yes, uh, well, um, you're going to want to go to www.colorado.gov slash LCS. Once you're there, click on the committees button, and then the interim committees button. And once you're on that page, the Lower North Fork Wildfire Commission is the top uh, uh, interim committee on that page. So, if you need further explanation, uh, again, yes, see after the meeting. Thank you. And I would just remind you um, that next Wednesday we'll be meeting again, August 22nd, uh, back at the Capitol. Um, we will do our best to. I know I was taking notes, I know staff was, uh, to try and get those answers to questions. Some is, is beyond our um, scope, but certainly we can do our best to convey to those whose mission it is to answer those questions to try and reach out to you. It seems like there might be an appropriate time to have a follow-up meeting down the road, uh, but I, at this time I'm not. I can't really offer that because we haven't had a chance to discuss that 
as a commission, but I certainly think that that would be appropriate. Um, I appreciate, and I know uh, all of us appreciate the time and energy you've put into this. Uh, we can't really tell you how sorry we are because, again, without being in your exact shoes, but um, we are, we are sorry. We're sorry that this has uh, happened and we will do our best to try and fulfill that part of the legislation that said uh, work to make this not happen to anybody else again. Uh, so with that, I'd like to again say thank you for being here and 